so um, my goal here is to um, to okay, well, the, the title is a bit general, like eco-evolutionary dynamic obstructive population. It's, uh, it's a bit uh, a very large topic, and uh, the reason the title is so large or broad is because uh, at first I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. But um, I'm going to try to narrow it down. So there will be two parts, a part which is, which is rather general about um, uh, structured populations and um, or more spe specifically class structured populations and how we can use reproductive value to make sense of this structure. And the other is um, uh, part will be about um, uh, applying these ideas to uh, uh, population with periodic dynamics and especially in uh, give an example of um, how we can understand some uh, evolution epidemiology models using these tools. So all natural populations are structured and uh, broadly speaking, you, you can uh, distinguish between spatial structure, which has been the focus of some of my work before, uh, and, and class structure, which is a, 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 a more recent uh, interest of mine. Um, of course, you can model in, in a way spatial structure with uh, class structure as a form of class structure in some cases. But if you think about um, a more continuous spatial structure, it's better maybe to dis distinguish the two. And often the questions you ask are slightly different. And in this talk, I'm going to, um, um, my interest is to try to show how we can um, uh, take into account this structure. Um, to understand the, uh, and model the population dynamics of the population, and then try to see how these uh, dynamics of structured populations can be used to understand evolution, evolution of traits, uh, either using a, an adaptive dynamics approach, like using invasion analysis, or a quantitative genetics approach, where you will be more interested into uh, tracking the dynamics of a trait average, for instance. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, class structure. And uh, what I mean by class structure is um, when um, individuals with, um, when you can, uh, sorry, um, uh, distinguish, distinguish different classes or different groups of individuals in the populations. For instance, they can have, some individuals have different ages, or you have, so you have age classes, or you have size classes. So here you have a size structured population of fish, for instance. You can have um, different develop, develop, developmental stages in the population, like larva, pupae, uh, adults. You have different physical morph, uh, like in um, uh, these uh, uh, insect societies. Uh, or you can also imagine, think of different habitat qualities. Uh, so the Illustration here is a map of the Netherlands with the vaccination coverage for measles. And in the center, you have a very low vaccination, vaccination coverage. So if you think about a, a, a pathogen that arrives in uh, this, uh, in this um, habitat, it's um, it going to encounter different uh, classes of uh, habitats, so some good habitats where you, do, you don't have a lot of vaccinated hosts, and some bad habitats where the vaccination coverage is quite high. So um, this is just to show that this idea of class structure is very general. You can apply at different levels of organization, you can apply at different uh, uh, geographical scales, and it's a very important concept in uh, uh, evolution ecology in general. So uh, the problem, you, yes? I'm really sorry to interrupt. No. Uh, show your presentation in... In what? Presentation mode. Presentation? Uh, I think it's, I mean, full screen, but uh, I can, like this? Yes. Is it a, uh, oh, you. okay, sorry. Uh, I thought I done no what worries. was needed, but okay. Um, so, uh, so my, my main motivation, uh, because I'm interested in models of uh, host pathogen interactions and evolutionary epidemiology, is to try to uh, use this idea of a class structure to uh, understand the evolution of pathogen traits. Um, so uh, pathogens, of course, infect structured host populations because not all hosts have the same quality for the pathogen. So one way to think about it is if you have a, a, a population of susceptible hosts in blue and they can be infected by a virus, 
for instance, they become infected. But you can also imagine that you, some of the hosts are treated, so uh, they're going to be the ST host, um, and uh, so now the virus can also infect the treated host if the treatment is not perfect. Um, and we have uh, so two classes of uh, hosts for the parasite, the non-treated host and the treated host. And of course, the treated host, if the treatment is, uh, is a good treatment, uh, represent a bad habitat for the parasite. So uh, when the, the virus enters this class of uh, uh, the hosts, you can expect maybe its reproductive success to be lower. Um, so the question is, if you have this um, class trip in the population with some hosts that are treated and some hosts that are not, uh, how is it going to affect the evolution of the uh, parasite and also the just epi epidemiological dynamics? So the epidemiological consequences are often quite uh, clear because uh, you can uh, expect that the pathogen spread will be more difficult when you increase the frequency of bad quality hosts. So you can imagine like um, uh, these uh, different hosts can be vaccinated or treated hosts, or, or it can be different host species, it can be different age classes, each with different uh, transmissibilities and uh, variants. Uh, so this is more or less um, easy to model. Uh, you just have to uh, write an ODE model with different classes. But then the evolutionary consequences are a bit more uh, difficult to um, uh, it's more, a bit more difficult to give in a, a prediction uh, right away without doing the model. Um, and the reason is that um, if you think about uh, uh, two pathogens with the same genetic background, so like a single virus viral strain, uh, it can have a different fitness in the high and low quality host uh, just, just because uh, the hosts have uh, different qualities. So maybe it's going to reproduce uh, better in the uh, untreated host. And in that case, if you look at the uh, change in frequency of, um, of a given mutation, uh, maybe you will see that it increases, but it has nothing to do with selection. It has only to do with the fact that uh, there are more good quality hosts, for instance. So the problem we're going to face is um, to try to um, give an evolutionary value to this, uh, to each host class. Okay, so because we need to take into account this value to uh, kind of extract the effect of selection on uh, a change in frequency of a given genotype that we may observe. And uh, uh, the, the, the way to do that, and it has been known for quite some time, is to uh, use reproductive value. And I'm going to, in, my, in the first part of the talk, talk a bit about um, uh, how we can uh, use reproductive value to make sense of that. And the second problem is what happens is there are uh, temporal fluctuations. So in that case, the quality of the host will vary over time because the abundance of the different host classes will change. And so we expect this evolutionary value to fluctuate as well. And um, classically, we don't have a very dynamic definition of reproductive value because we usually define reproductive value as an eigenvector in a um, equilibrium uh, for equilibrium dynamics. So I'm going to uh, show how we can uh, extend this idea to uh, take into account these temporal fluctuations. Okay, so the reproductive value trick uh, is quite whole. It dates back to Fisher. And here I'm going to try to present what I hope is a fresh look. Maybe it's not that fresh. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and the basics is to assume, um, make some assumptions. So uh, for this talk, I'm going to assume a large population. So there will be no Stochasticity, it would be fully deterministic. Uh, and clonally reproducing types, uh, subtypes will be different genotypes or phenotypes. Uh, K discrete classes, so we have different classes that can represent like different age classes, different habitats, whatever. And I'm going to work in uh, continuous time. Um, the notations that we'll need basically are uh, these ones, the NIK, so is the density of type I individuals in class K. So it means if you have a look at the genotype I, how many individuals with uh, genotype I are present in class K. And um, the NK variable is just the sum of all genotypes, so it's the total density of individuals in class K. So it's the number of individuals in, in, in class K at a given time. 
then you can collect all these densities in a vector n of class densities. And then very importantly, you have um, uh, the transition rates of the uh, type R individuals from class K to class J, which are noted R, uh, subscript I and superscript JK. So note that everything that is about class I put as a superscript and everything that is about types I put as a subscript just to make things clear. So this is the main ingredients of the, of the model. And from here, uh, you can easily write uh, some dynamics. But first, you have to specify uh, uh, something about the rates, because in general, the rates uh, will depend on uh, the environmental feedback. So for instance, it can depend on the densities of conspecifics, or maybe a density of a resource. Uh, for instance, susceptible hosts in the host parasite model are a resource for the parasite. Um, so you will need to have um, this dependency on uh, the environment very explicit. And one way to think about the environment, which is uh, very Fisherian, but also very much uh, ingrained in adaptive dynamics, is to uh, look at the feedback between from individual to population to the environment and back to the individual. And basically, the environment is just all the information you need to compute the reproduction and survival of individuals. So it's a very individually centered concept. And there are two main um, uh, components in this environment feedback is the interesting intrinsic effects, which are basically the NIK, so that's density of conspecifics. And then everything that is external to the focal population you're looking, so that would be the uh, this vector E, and it's going to be everything, the density of resources, predators, prey, whatever. Uh, the important thing is that we don't need to spell out ex explicitly this environment uh, in the derivation, but we just to be aware that we just need sorry to be aware that it's there. So the first step is that we can write the dynamics for the class density. So if we can, if we go in the field, we look at the different, uh, at the dynamics of different um, classes in the population. This is what we're going to try to model. If we were interested in population dynamics, we want to know how these classes change over time. And basically it's just given by this ODE, uh, where the vector of class densities change according to this equation, where R is the matrix of average transition rates. So that means that you compute the transition rates, but you are average over, like for instance, R bar, JK is the average over all uh, genotypes that are present in class K of the transition from K to J. So this allows me to introduce this notation here, FIK, which is the frequency of the type R individuals within class K, simply the the ratio between the number of individuals of type R in class K over the total density of individuals in class K. So with this um, uh, equation, we can do just population dynamics. Okay, if we, if we suppose we don't know anything about the genetic variation in the population, what we're going to try to estimate in the field will be the, uh, the matrix R of average transition rates. So we just going to um, have access to this average rate. In general, if we have, um, we'll need some of the equations for the dynamics of intrinsic factors. For instance, if you have a consumer resource model, you will have another equation for the results if you're focusing on the consumers. Um, so this is basically ecology, okay? But now if we want to uh, add evolution and, and, and if we're interested in how the frequency of the different types change, okay, uh, we can uh, compute the dynamics of the frequencies. So like this is the, this is the full equal dynamics with the dynamics of the ecological variables and the dynamics of the more evolutionary variables, which are the uh, frequency of type I in class K. And that simply depends on um, uh, the sum of the, um, it, sorry, it depends on how well type I uh, transmit from class J to class K compared to the average transition rates from class J to class K. Um, so it's a very simple equation, but of course there are a lot of uh, difficulties in trying to uh, understand this equilibrium dynamics because uh, both depends on one another. So the two are coupled. There's uh, no way to easily uh, uh, decouple the two. 
unless we're ready to make some more assumptions. Uh, an impo important notation that I'm going to introduce now is fk, which is the frequency of class k, which is simply the, the ratio between the number of individuals in class k and the total number of individuals in the population. So it's different from fik, which was about the frequency of a genotype. Here it's the frequency of class k, so it's an ecological uh, variable. Okay, so can we decouple selection from demography in a way? Um, and um, what do we need to do to do that? Uh, one way to make progress is to um, introduce an average phenotypic, phenotypic trait. So, um, and uh, to try to track the dynamics of this average trait. So the average trait can be computed within a class, for instance, class K, this average trait Z bar K is uh, just the average of the trait values uh, weighted by the frequency of each genotype in the class K. Sorry, it's an I here. I made a mistake. It's a sum of an I. And then we have the average trait in the population, which is an average over all classes, so over K, of the average trait within class K times the frequency of class K. And this is this average trait at the population level that we are interested in. Uh, if we try to write an equation for the dynamics of this trait, we're going to have a class structured price equation which has the following form. So there are two terms. The first one is a within class term in the sense that it's the average of all classes. So the weights here are the frequency of each class of the covariance within each class K between the trait and um, the transition rates from class K to another class J. So this is uh, a covariance term, which represents the, like, um, the average of all the within class uh, selection effects, if you want. But then there's another term which uh, represents what happens between classes and which depends on the, um, this quantity here, which is the difference between the uh, mean trait in class K and the mean trait at the population level. And this is weighted by uh, the average transition uh, rate from class K to class uh, to all class J's. So the important thing here is that if this phenotypic differentiation is non is zero, we don't have this term. But if it's non-zero for whatever reasons, uh, this term will contribute to the dynamics of the uh, mean trait. Um, and so importantly, if to if if you assume that the trait we measure because we don't know, which we pick a random trait in the population, and it turns out this trait has no effect on the transition rates here. In that case, it's easy to see that the covariance here will be zero, okay? Because if the, the transition rates don't depend on the trait we're uh, measuring and for which we're tracking the average, then this term is going to vanish. But this term is not necessarily zero. If there's some phenotypic differentiation here, if this uh, Z bar K minus Z bar is non-zero, uh, then we'll have uh, an effect which can be positive or negative. And so we can still have directional change in the mean trait because of this second term. So this is a ph uh, phenomenon that uh, Alan Graffen uh, termed the passive changes in the trait mean. Um, and uh, basically it means that if you see some fluctuations in the mean trait or in the population, um, you will have some of it which is due to selection and some of it will be due to uh, demographic transitions uh, which uh, will uh, also happen in a neutral population, for instance. So to, to give you an idea, here's some simulated data of an age structured population. We have the total density, which uh, here we can see it fluctuates. And here we have some change in the, in the mean trait. And you see that it changes over time, it fluctuates. And you could say, well, maybe this is selection creating this, um, these uh, fluctuations. But actually, no, it's the, here in this, um, simulated data, the trait I'm looking at has no effect on the transition rates, it's completely neutral. So uh, if we want to look at the effect of selection, you, we should see no fluctuations here. What we see is the result of uh, demographic transitions. So how can we get rid of these passive changes? Um, the, the, the trick is to extend an idea by Fisher and use a weighted average. And what is Fisher suggested is to use uh, reproductive values as weights. So 
for now, let's just assume that we can uh, assign each individual a class specific weight, dk of t, and we make this uh, weight dependent on time. Then we can compute a, a weighted average of the trait. So instead of uh, the normal arithmetic average where VK, the VKs are all one, we compute a weighted uh, average. And we assume that the VK are co-normalized with the class frequencies so that the sum of VK, FK is equal to one. If we do that um, and we do some stuff, uh, which is basically deriving a price equation for this weighted average, we obtain this very simple um, uh, covariance term. Um, so there's, there's only one term, no second term anymore. And the important thing is here, here we have this weights vj which appear. Uh, we only obtain such a simple equation if the ck satisfy a very specific equation, a dynamical equation. And actually you can interpret this um, a dynamical equation, also look at the discrete time uh, version of it. And you can, in the end, be convinced that actually the CK here are the class reflective value of class K at time T. So CK is the product of VK, the individual reflective value and the class frequencies. So we are back to the concept of uh, class and individual reflective values, which are very important in eco evolutionary ecology. Um, but the difference is that uh, these uh, quantities are uh, dynamical, so they depend on time. If we compare the two price equations side by side, either with weights unity or with property value weighting, we, we see that the, the green terms are very similar, except that instead of having a one here, we have the property value here. And it, turn, it, it seems that everything works as if all this blue term, the second between class term uh, can be uh, is removed from the equation and uh, uh, and we extract the signal of selection from it and the signal is captured by the property value vj okay so we have removed everything that is due to the passive changes and we retain only the effect of selection on the second term <clears throat> so this equation can be put in matrix form uh, so this or again, the dynamics of the weighted mean trait. And basically we have a very simple equation where we have um, VTCF, so the V, uh, T is transposed, the V and F are these demographic quantities which represent either the individual reflective values of each class and the frequency of each class. C is the matrix of covariances uh, that represents selection and we have the interplay between demography and selection that uh, uh, allows to capture the effect of uh, selection on uh, on the on this mean trait. And another interpretation we can make is that in a way this f, this frequencies of class, uh, represents the quantity of each class, and the v represents the quality of the different uh, classes of, a, of or rather of an individual in each of these class. Okay. Um, if we go back to data analysis, it means that in my first case, if I compute the, uh, the weighted average, I, I have a, a, a flat line because I'm looking at a neutral model. If you, we look at a model with a tiny bit of selection, we can uh, have actually this red line, which uh, shows that you can uh, smooth out the fluctuations that are due to demography and get a better estimate of the selection gradient in a way. Okay, and the last uh, thing I wanted to sh say about this part, and that's how I'm not sure I'm going to keep my time, but I'm, I'll try, um, is that for these demographic variables, the frequencies of each class and the property value of individuals in each class, we have some dynamical equations, which represent simply the forward and backward looking ways of looking at demography. Uh, here, R bar is the per capita growth rate of the total population, but it doesn't really matter. The important thing is that in principle, we could, we have some equations to calculate also the reproductive value at each time. I'm not saying it is easy. I'm just saying that in principle, we can do it. Um, in the limit cases where you have either exponential growth or um, equilibrium populations, uh, you can recover the fact that the V and the F are 
uh, right and left eigenvectors of the transition matrix of the uh, population. And so we work over all these classical eigenvectors results for reproductive value and class frequencies. Um, okay, so, so far, um, uh, well, I'm skipping a very uh, take on message, but that's just because I'm just saying everything I've been uh, saying already, but I can come back to that in the questions if you want. My, the main interest of this um, time-dependent property value, well, one of the main interests is, is if you look at, um, um, at situations where you have evolution in, in temporal, temporally varying environments, for instance, assume you have periodic fluctuations in your population, um, and on this periodic attractor of the population, you will be able to compute the reproductive value at a given time uh, during, uh, during these periodic fluctuations. So that's what, what I'm going to do now. Um, and the interest is, so with this time dependent reproductive values, we'll have a, a measure of the quality of each class when it varies over time because of these fluctuations. We know how to handle this periodic uh, dynamics in IP dynamics. Uh, usually, we have, can compute the invasion fitness using a tool that is the Floca exponent of a rare mutant. Uh, this is uh, well known. This is not doesn't mean that it's very useful, very sorry, very often used. Uh, in fact, for class structured populations, uh, there are there's little work on that, and that's mainly because. Often, uh, you can also only achieve results by numerical integration, so that's a bit frustrating for theoreticians, I guess. Uh, with time-dependent uh, reproductive values, it's possible to go one step further uh, and have an identical expression of the selection gradient. Um, one way to do that, and for now I'm going to focus on a simple model where you have only two types, a Y type and a mutant type, and I'm interested in tracking the change in the frequency of the mutant type. So if, I'm, I'm st if I start with the reproductive value weighted frequency of the mutant type, which is this expression, so you have this reproductive value weight for class K, the frequency of the mutant in class K, and the frequency of class K at T. If we, if we calculate this, the dynamics of this weighted frequency, we obtain this equation. Uh, and see that it, it, it takes the form of a within class genetic variance times um, a, now, a weighted average of the transition difference in transition rates between the mutant and the uh, resonant type. Okay, this quantity, the, the brown box, I will come back to later. And it has to be contra contrasted with the dynamics of the class densities, which depends on the average transition rates as we have already shown, and this is the blue box here. And now if we use weak selection, so we assume that um, the mutant trait is very, is epsilon close to the resident uh, trait. And if we write the vital rates are explicit functions of the phenotypes. So um, instead of writing R M K J, I write this as a function of the trait of the mutant. Uh, then we can tailor expand these quantities. And what we observe is that this brown box here, this brown term, uh, is um, is of order epsilon, okay, and it's proportional to the um, uh, first derivative of the transition rate with respect to the trait, but it's of order epsilon. And the average transition rate is of order one. It depends on just, it can be uh, evaluated to first order as the um, um, transition rate of the mutant, of the, sorry, of the resident, uh, uh, strain. So we have a uh, uh, separation of time scale between the two equations because uh, the dynamics of the class frequencies is going to be of order epsilon and the dynamics of the class densities is going to be of order one. Um, and so we have some fast variables which are the class densities but also the repetitive values actually and the class frequencies of course are going to be uh, a fast variable, and they are going to converge to, towards a resident periodic attractor. And in contrast, the RV weighted mutant frequency is a slow variable and can be written to first order in this following form as epsilon times uh, genetic variance term and times a, a selection gradient at, at, at time t, which take this form. This is the, the 
the sum over all uh, all classes of the product between the repetitive value, the marginal effect of selection on the transition rate from J to K, and the frequency of class J. So basically, this is the same exact um, form as a selection gradient uh, for an equilibrium population, except that is it is time dependent. So uh, it's very easy. And the last thing you can do is uh, under weak selection, when we have this separation of time scale, there's something called the averaging principle. That means that we can uh, iron out the fluctuations in this uh, uh, time dependent selection gradient and obtain a very good approximation for the uh, uh, density of the uh, mutant, uh, sorry, the frequency of the mutant uh, by just writing this logistic equation where you have um, the S, which is a function of T here, is replaced by just the average over one period of the uh, instantaneous selection gradient. So we end up with three results. First, the section gradient has the same form as the section gradient for equilibrium dynamics. Uh, second, we uh, can use this average uh, over one period to uh, calculate the potential endpoints of evolution, like we will do in any adaptive dynamics model uh, for a section gradient. And uh, then we recover the invasion implies fixation results, which means that um, this uh, mean over one period of ST is a, a number, okay, and it can be positive, or negative, and so the direction of selection is independent on the frequency of the mutant. So uh, it means that one, if we have um, invasion of the mutant, uh, it goes to fixation. So we can look at other papers for that. There's a the most recent, uh, two most recent up, uh, the one by Preglobil and Lehman on class structured. Uh, uh, population that uh, uses some similar uh, ideas. And uh, Kai and Geritz uh, in last year looked at um, the same kind of ideas, but with random environments, which is so periodic environments, which is a special case of that. Okay, so that's good. Uh, in a way, we can just make the equilibrium section gradient time dependent, take the average over one period, and we have the section gradient for periodic environments. I hasten to say that this is not true for invasion fitness, only for the selection gradient, so only when you use wood selection. The benefit is that we can retain the biological insight of uh, reproductive value concept. The downside is that we often can only calculate this reproductive value on the att resident attractor and the class frequencies uh, numerically. But that's also, also true of the flow care approach. Um, do I have time to finish? <laughs> Sorry, a little bit long. I'll try. Um, so to just give you an idea of how we can apply these ideas to a real, well, not a real world example, but a kind of biologically more explicit example, um, I'm going to look at um, a kind of two host uh, host by that model. Basically, you have host A and host B, and when the hosts um, who produce, they can be produced at they can produce either susceptible host A or susceptible host B, and new of T is the uh, probability of production of uh, A hosts at time T, so, and we make that a periodic function, so it, it's a periodically forced system. And then uh, the, the susceptible host can be infected, and uh, there's a, a force of infection, which is HT, which depends on the transmission of the different infected hosts. And we have also another parameter, PA and PB, which uh, um, will be used to model the preference of the parasite for the different host class. And the question I'm asking is, uh, what is the effect of these fluctuations on the evolution of host preference? So uh, suppose that you have a virus that is produced by this HT uh, force of infection, and then can encounter either A host or B host, and we assume that uh, the trait we're looking at that is the preference for us A. So if Z, Z, sorry, Z is zero, it means that uh, even if it encounters A host, it will never uh, infect the host and, be, and transition to, to IA class. In contrast, if Z is zero, it will, uh, with 100% prob chance, we will going to uh, transition from the SB to the IB class. And if, if Z is one, 
of uh, it was is one half, uh, then it has equal chance to um, uh, transition from uh, S to I uh, on in the A class or in the B class. And what I'm assuming is that the two classes only differ by the virulence. So the virulence of this uh, A class is greater than the B class, but they have the same transmissibility. So the pathogen has just a lower survival in A class than B class. So the A class is bad for the pathogen because it, it, its survival is, 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 is uh, lower. So should the pathogen prefer the bad or the good uh, host? And uh, the, the question may seem obvious, but it's not obvious at all because uh, the answer depends on the av availability of each host class, which can fluctuate in this model. So it's not uh, obvious at all what's going to happen. If we compute the selection gradient using the method I've just described, we have a very simple results, which is uh, it's the transmission rate beta times this difference between these two quantities, which is the average of the product of the reproductive value of A class times the density of susceptible in A class, and the same for the B class. And we can understand these quantities as future reproductive output at time t. If a virus enters a SA host at time t, uh, its, its future uh, reproductive output would be VA, so the if you make the product the ASI, it gives you the uh, future objective output of a uh, virus propagule at time t in class B, in class A, sorry, and in class B, we have the same uh, idea. So this means that the pathogen will evolve preference for the host class A if its average propagative output is larger in class A than in class B, uh, which uh, we can uh, der derive from this section gradient. So it's quite simple. It looks a bit like a tautology, but still uh, that's a result. Um, and just to give you um, an, an idea, and then I will stop because I'm already too long. I'm just going to show you the dynamics on different time scales of this model. So here you have all the fast time scale dynamics of so the ecological variables. So we have nu of t here, which is the probability of producing a host, which fluctuates with a kind of step like step like function but it, it doesn't matter which function we use and then we have the densities of susceptible infected hosts that vary also over time and we can have the reproductive values also that vary over time and we see that in this case the reproductive value of the b class is always higher than the reproductive value of the a class but still uh, it doesn't it don't it doesn't mean that uh, you should always go in the b class if now we look at the slow time scale and we look at the dynamics of the mutant frequency, you, you see here the time is uh, huge here. So we are really looking at a very slow time scale. Uh, there are two curves here. The one is the prediction of the reproductive value uh, weighted frequency, and the other is the actual mutant frequency. And you see that you can't distinguish the two. But if you zoom in, you can distinguish, distinguish the two. Here is the uh, average selection gradient prediction. And here you have uh, up and downs that represent the fact that at each time, sometimes it's going to the A class would be, it's better to be in the A class and sometimes it's better to be in the B class. And this is well predicted by the change in the uh, difference in reproductive outputs between the A class and the B class. Um, and what we see is that the average value of this difference is slightly is, is greater than zero, it's positive, hence the uh, direction of selection which uh, allows a uh, mutant to invade. Okay, um, and yeah, just to conclude, so you can also calculate the ESS as a function of period, and I just want to show that here the ESS as a function of the period is very well, matches very well the prediction of the uh, a classical Floquet exponent prediction. So we, we really have a very good match. And in that case, what we see that the fluctuations uh, create a uh, deviation from the equilibrium solution, which saturates as the period increases. Okay, so this is going to be my conclusion. So we have a, a general approach for reproductive value 
that can be applied to um, structured epidemiological models with complex dynamics. And the, the good thing is that it allows for direct analytical comparison with the equilibrium expressions of the section gradient. But there are many more interesting things you can do. And one is the version of variance in response in periodic treatments, which leads to more uh, interesting results. And this is currently what Alicia Walter, PhD of mine, is doing. And there are also some extensions in progress uh, to do quantitative genetics with uh, some multimodal distributions with uh, address set in my foots. Um, and I'm going to stop here. I want to thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't too long, not too boring. And uh, I just want to add that uh, this is working in collaboration also with some of this work is in collaboration with uh, Siva Gonto as well for the uh, periodic section gradient stuff. Okay, thank you.